Welcome to the Manga Bay Newscast. It's June 28th, 2022, and I'm your host, Mike Gorecki, bringing you the news and inspiration from Nature's Frontline. Today we're taking a look at two stories that show the effectiveness of utilizing both Western science and traditional indigenous ecological knowledge for conservation and restoration initiatives. Earlier this month, we featured indigenous aquaculture projects on this podcast, looking at mussel farms in New Zealand and clam gardens in British Columbia, Canada. Today we're sticking with aquatic environments and taking a look at two more projects, one focused on seagrasses in Mexico and the other on fish on Canada's Atlantic coast. Our first guest is Dr. Gary Paul Nabham, an ethnobotanist at the University of Arizona. He tells us about eelgrass, an ancestral food of the Comcac people in the state of Sonora in Mexico. Nabham tells us why eelgrass is making a big comeback as a sustainable source of food for the Comcac community and why it's gaining international attention in the process. We also speak today with Sarah Iverson, a professor of biology at Canada's Dalhousie University, about a project called Apocnema Toltec that aims to better understand the movements of lobster, eel, and tomcod in two important ecosystems on Canada's Atlantic coast. Iverson tells us why those study species were chosen by the Mi'kmaq people and why it's so important that the project combines different ways of knowing, including Western science and traditional indigenous knowledge. We wanted to do this from a two-eyed seeing approach, which was a concept developed by Mi'kmaq elder Albert Marshall. Two-eyed seeing is essentially learning to see with the strengths of indigenous knowledge from one eye and with the strengths of Western knowledge from the other eye and using both eyes together in order to benefit all. Gary Nabham is a first-generation Lebanese-American who is an ethnobotanist, collaborative conservationist, and the Kellogg Endowed Chair at the University of Arizona. He also helped to recently launch a festival with the Comcac people in Mexico to celebrate indigenous foods like eelgrass. Here he is telling us a little bit about what eelgrass is and why it's deserving of a festival to celebrate it. Eelgrass is a widespread plant. It is not a true grass, but in a related family called Zosteraceae. So the eelgrass that is in much of the Pacific is Zostera marina, but it's also found in the Atlantic along with other species. And eelgrass species are major stabilizers of shallow coastlines and tidal wetlands all over the world. So it's a widespread Uh, species both in the Atlantic and Pacific. But there's very few places in the world where it produces large quantities of seeds. Usually it produces by vegetative reproduction and occasional uh, seed germination. In the Gulf of California, which we also call the Sea of Cortez, on the uh, western coast of Mexico between Baja California and the Mexican mainland, Almost all the populations produce enormous quantities of seeds uh, as it grows on the sea bottom and in water depths of two to five meters, you know, up to up to 15 feet or so. And those seagrass meadows or pastures are the major uh, feeding grounds and, and uh, sanctuaries for the blue eating crabs, for some kinds of scallops and lobsters. Uh, for over 70 fin fish uh, that are used in commercial fisheries for seafood, and for five species of sea turtles in the Pacific Ocean. And it's also traditionally been a source of food for local indigenous peoples, right? Well, here's a remarkable irony of all of this. A widespread species that other indigenous people have used in other parts of the world for its foliage But the Seri are the only living culture known to have 500-year-old tradition or more of using eelgrass seed as a food. You're calling them Seri, but you're talking about the Comcac people, right? Are those names used interchangeably? In most of the literature over the last 400 years, S-E-R-I, Seri, is the name used in both Spanish and English literature for the people who call themselves Comcac. And like okay. many indigenous people, in their language, that simply means the true people or the authentic people. 
Okay, thank you for clearing that up. So you were talking about the Comcac people or the Siri people and eelgrass. In their very warm hypersaline waters, uh, eelgrass produces about 20,000 seeds per square meter, an enormous yield for any grain in the world. And you don't have to pull the plants up to harvest it like we have to with wheat or barley or, or uh, amaranth or quinoa. The plants detach from their roots as they produce seed. They're translocating all their energy into seed production. And so they float up from the bottom and uh, with wave action form large windrows on the beaches of the Sea of Cortez and elsewhere in the world. And we have Spanish missionary records of this uh, Concac or Seri Indian community uh, consuming eelgrass from as early as uh, the 1650s and a continual documentation of them using that ever since. The only other place that we have a record of any indigenous people using the seed for certain in the world is on uh, Isla Cedros Island off the coast of San Diego, where in some Matadis found out on the island, archaeologists were puzzled, well, why are there Matadis out here? Because people can't grow corn, and so they don't need a grindstone for corn, but why are they using Matadi grindstones out here on an island, uh, you know, dozens of miles out into the ocean? And then they, they did microanalysis of what they found on the grindstone surface, and they identified it as eelgrass seeds, prehistorically used. So it may have been that people all around the peninsula of Baja California also used eelgrass. So it's the seeds that are used for food. Can you tell us more about how they're prepared or eaten? Well, there's probably a dozen different ways of uh, using it. It tastes very much like the wild rice that Winona Leduc and the Ojibwe and, and Chippewa peoples of the Northern Great, Lake, Great Lakes used. I've harvested wild rice with the Bad River Reservation community up on near the shores of Lake Superior. Um, it's, a, it's a nutty flavor, but before our recent Native Foods Festival in the Concoc communities in early May, we only know of one other attempt to make bread with eelgrass, and that was made in the 1970s when one of my mentors, Richard Felger, wrote about it on the cover of Science, the discovery of the nutritional value of eelgrass seeds by the Seri Indians. It was a cover story of Science Magazine, the most prestigious science magazine in the mid-1970s, and his partner at the time made a loaf of bread from eelgrass, that, from seed that she brought home. This last month, we had a festival to celebrate over a dozen different kinds of foods from the desert and sea with the Concoc community. And they worked with four different chefs and bakers of international renown and 20 indigenous women that are used to making sort of balls with honey or oil pressed together to hold the seeds about the size of meatballs, for example, and then they either eat those um, raw or after boiling the seeds and pressing them into these balls. And they also make uh, Mexican gruels that are called pinole or atole uh, with the seeds and make things that look like tootsie rolls that can be easily carried on boats for fishermen, again, using historically sea turtle oil as the matrix for keeping the seeds together. But incredible baker who has a nonprofit called uh, Bakers Without Borders, Panaderos Sin Fronteras, Dan Guerra, who's of Mexican, Irish, and Yaqui Indian descent, joined us with other chefs for a, a workshop on how to cook with eelgrass. And he and the Concoc women made uh, several loaves of eelgrass bread that was absolutely delicious. And ironically, the same month, Don was given the James Beard Award in New York City at a tux and tie banquet for being the best baker in the United States this year. 
So they really had a remarkable opportunity to collaborate with an incredible baker of indigenous descent, and they just love uh, sharing cooking techniques reciprocally with all these chefs from Spain, the United States, and Mexico. And so all of those chefs were part of that festival celebrating indigenous foods that you mentioned? Yes, uh, it included uh, chefs from a Poniente, uh, a world-famous restaurant in Cadiz, Spain, uh, that is also supporting eelgrass restoration in tidal wetlands near Cadiz, Spain, on the Atlantic, and at other places on the Iberian Peninsula. And they've helped form an international network of people working to restore eelgrass, not just for its food value, but for its uh, ecosystem services and sequestering carbon and its capacity to protect coastlines from damaging storms and winds and hurricanes and cyclones. So the Comcac people have traditionally used eelgrass as a food source, but my understanding is that for a generation or two, its use had really declined. You hit it on the head. Um, With uh, the introduction of globalized foods, the diversity in their diet uh, went down dramatically to just six 60% of what they historically ate in terms of the number of plant food species alone. Because of overfishing in waters to the north or south of them, they now use far fewer fish of the 300 different kinds of food they use, uh, fish that they used to eat. So there's then a decline in the use of native local foods in nearly every indigenous community I've ever worked with. But it had persisted with some elderly women that just loved the taste so much. And so they were able to teach their daughters and granddaughters how to harvest it. And this last year's harvest, which we did with support from the 11th Hour Fund of the uh, Smith Foundation uh, on the East Coast, allowed the largest eelgrass seed harvest in over 60 years. And elderly people remembered that and were weeping. They were so moved that this food is being revived as well as the the seagrass meadows being better protected than ever before. And is that protection important because eelgrass, like many seagrasses around the world, are declining due to human activities? Yes, dozens of patches or populations of eelgrass have already been lost from the Gulf of California due to dredging uh, near the mouths of estuaries and backwater lagoons to allow boat access or the construction of marinas or bottom fishing with nets and dredge-like scoops to pick up scallops and lobsters. So in most of the Gulf of California and the Pacific coast of Mexico, eelgrass is endangered, and that's the irony. Indigenous people as caretakers have done far better at protecting eelgrass populations in their their cultural habitats or and natural habitats than have uh, the thousands of marine conservationists uh, academically trained around the world. Can you tell us about the Comcac people's conservation and restoration initiatives? Next to fishing, conservation-related restoration and monitoring projects are the largest employee in their communities now for the 1,500 Concoc individuals that live in two villages. And over the last 15 years in a program that we call the Pare Ecologo Training Program, dozens of uh, women and men from age 16 up to age 40 have gone through three-month-long trainings with marine biologists and and ecologists and and conservation professionals to learn how to uh, restore different shellfish species, land plants, eelgrass, mangroves, and other things that are critical to carbon sequestration, protection of coastlines against uh, sea level rising. And uh, we're uh, going into the second of three and a half years of a specific project that the Concoc community has, uh, restoring mangrove lagoons. They have three species of mangroves that grow at the northern limits of their ranges in the Pacific coast in their territorial waters, and then doing the same a little bit further out into the uh, Gulf of California with the eelgrass uh, meadows. 
So it's active restoration, seeding and transplanting of eelgrass and mangroves. You've already touched on the benefits of eelgrass and other seagrass habitats for the environment, for wildlife, and for the climate. But is there anything else you'd add in terms of its ecological benefits? Well, rather remarkably, um, when we first started the paracologist program with the Siri with about uh, 15 young people, we showed a movie from Hawaii about Hawaiian indigenous youth uh, protecting sea turtle nesting grounds. And it was like a, a conversion moment. I, I don't want to uh, be uh, too metaphorical about this, but they all stood up as soon as they saw the video and said, that's what we want to do. Our elders know more about sea turtles than anyone else in the world. They told us that the eelgrass meadows are essential to keeping sea turtles in our waters. And even though four of the five in da- uh, species of sea turtles are endangered in the Pacific, we want to bring them back using our, our grandparents' knowledge of them. So they started a group called Grupo Tortuguero Concac, the pro-conservation for sea turtles nonprofit of the uh, Concac community. And they started working with biologists to radio tag sea turtles and monitor them and protect all the beaches within their territory. And the last couple uh, summers, late in the summer, along with other conservation donors like Cafe Tacuba, the great Mexican uh, rot group, uh, we've been present, present when the uh, Seri youth release hundreds of sea turtle hatchlings back into the waters of Gulf of California from sea turtle nests that they protected. And they've won the World Ocean Day Award from the Cousteau Society National Geographic at the National Press Club in Washington, D.C. for starting an international indigenous sea turtle conservation network. We're we're joining other indigenous peoples in Costa Rica to celebrate the formation of that group two decades ago uh, this next month and taking CONCAC women down to Costa Rica to cross-train other indigenous people who live on the coast of Latin America. Any final thoughts on how important it is for Western scientists and conservationists to take indigenous knowledge into account? So as, as final words, I'd just like to say that indigenous people who live on coastlines are being differentially affected by climate change. Uh, sea level rising is already toppling houses that are falling into the ocean there. So they are in the brunt of where climate change will most immediately affect human societies. And yet cultural knowledge, indigenous orally transmitted knowledge is as important to dealing with uh, land and water conservation and restoration, the restoration of natural habitats and, and sacred places and the uh, restoration of wildlife than anyone else. Now we'll hear from Sarah Iverson, who, in addition to being a professor of biology at Dalhousie University, is also scientific director of the Ocean Tracking Network, an aquatic animal tracking technology and data management platform based at Dalhousie. Iverson also works with the Apocnema Toltec Project, and she offered this background on its founding and mission. The Ocean Tracking Network basically tracks aquatic, that's both uh, marine and freshwater species, to document movement, survival, habitat use, and in relation to changing environments. And it, it's now a, a, a global aquatic tracking network. And we also monitor ocean conditions and host a internationally certified database. As part of our projects, we work across Canada and around the world to try and better understand basically species movements and survival and to better inform sustainable management practices. So within Canada, we've worked closely, certainly in the Arctic, with local Inuit populations to to try and co-develop research programs, in that case on Greenland halibut. In the Pacific, um, we've worked closely with First Nations there to, for instance, try and inform the very endangered and declining sockeye salmon populations. When we started to think about this strategic partnership program funded by NSERC, what we wanted to do was work with uh, Mi'kmaq communities to co-develop 
and co-manage and basically co-do -re research and train highly qualified personnel, students, um, HQP, to try and address what the community needs really were in terms of answering the questions they felt most important to be answered. And so we didn't even start developing the project until we assembled partners from Mi'kmaq communities, local fishers, and academia, as well as Department of Fisheries and Oceans, to try and start figuring out what, what we thought were the biggest needs, the information gaps, and what would be most beneficial to the communities to understand more about. And we wanted to do this from a two-eyed seeing approach, um, which was a concept developed by Mi'kmaq elder Albert Marshall. That two-eyed seeing is, is essentially learning to see with the strengths of indigenous knowledge from one eye and with the strengths of Western knowledge from the other eye and using both eyes together in order to benefit all. And so we started to work with our partners and we wanted to specifically address two very important ecosystems. These are both unique and biologically rich marine ecosystems in Nova Scotia. First, the Bay of Fundy minus Basin, which is a highly productive, tidally driven ecosystem that supports both resident and seasonally migratory species. And the Bredore Lake, which is a complex estuarine ecosystem that provides important habitat for many fish and invertebrate species and is also a UNESCO World Biosphere Reserve. Where does the name Apocnema Toltec come from and what does it mean? You know, we started to build this project together and it was actually, we wanted to identify a name for it. And we felt this was really important to, to get our identity across. And we asked Elder Albert Marshall to help us come up with that. And he came up with um, Apocnema which is Mi'kmaq for we help each other. And that's been the basically the basis from which we've all worked together to develop, to co-develop this research project and training program. Why is it important that this project employs two-eyed seeing? Well, um, from several standpoints, I mean, traditional ecological knowledge, you know, basically revolves, refers to the knowledge acquired by indigenous and local peoples over hundreds and sometimes even thousands of years through direct contact with the environment in which they live. And so it's knowledge that's specific to location, but it's, it includes the relationship between plants, animals, and humans, landscape, timing of events, th things that, that also inform those local ways of life. And this is really important historical knowledge that Western knowledge systems don't always have. Western scientists come into a place and study it, you know, for a period of time, and they often lack that long-term traditional background knowledge. And the knowledge that these local peoples and fishers have, they're on the water, they're, they're, they're in the ecosystem. They have seen things that, that have been passed down through generations that are incredibly important and things that, you know, we as academics would have really no idea about. And, and I think the concept of combining traditional ecological knowledge with Western scientific knowledge isn't necessarily new. I, I think probably um, local biological knowledge informed a lot of early, you know, biology I mean, even Darwin on his voyage of the Beagle took interest in the local biological knowledge of the peoples he encountered. But it's largely been very separated and Western scientists have gone about, you know, doing designing and doing the studies that they think are important and then implementing management strategies that don't take into account the local peoples that really have some of this knowledge. And, and then on the other hand, the people with that traditional knowledge do have really long-term knowledge about their systems, their ecosystems. But in a time, particularly now more than ever, of hugely rapidly changing ecosystems and climate change, they can't possibly have all the answers and they know that. And so they know things are changing and 
are willing to embrace some of the technologies that we can offer to work together to try and better answer the questions that we want answered. You mentioned local fishers. How important is their knowledge to the project? Equally important in that Darren Porter is one of our key partners, and he's a fisher in the Minas Basin and has been extremely important in terms of helping us um, establish these partnerships. And, you know, as he says, like the local Mi'kmaq, he's on the water. You know, he sees things that academics don't necessarily know when they come in to study a system. And yet he also values what academics can help him to understand. For instance, you know, with OTN, our ability to track species in ways that nobody else could, there's no other way to find out where they're going, where they're maybe overwintering, where they might be spawning, what might be, what habitats are influencing these movements. And so I think everybody came together on this project, wanting to work together to share the knowledge systems and to co-design this. And that being said, it wasn't necessarily, it wasn't easy. I mean, you know, you're you're trying to respect um, very different bases of knowledge and uses and and the kinds of principles that, you know, Western versus indigenous societies have. And so, you know, there were times that difficult discussions had to be had and and people had to teach each other what difficulties they have been through or that had to be resolved. And I think that's the other thing about this project that has taught us so much is that it takes time to build those partnerships and that trust and that space where people feel very comfortable expressing their their views, their opinions, their wants and needs. And, you know, we have been, we now, all of us feel really privileged to have taken that time. But I think the other thing we've learned is that time does not match academic timescales. For instance, we have in this past project, we've had four master's students and a master's program takes between two and two and a half years to complete. Well, it it took two to three years just to really build that relationship space and that dialogue. And I think, so that's something that we've learned certainly in terms of the academic programs of students that people talk about combining um, knowledge systems, but it takes, it really takes time. As you mentioned, the project is focused on studying lobster, eel, and tomcod. Who chose those species and why? Well, there had to be a place to start. There are a number of species in both of those ecosystems that are really, they're valued uh, commercially, they're valued locally, they're valued um, for food and even medicine. And of course, you know, lobster is sort of a no brainer. It's one of the most um, valued fisheries in Atlantic Canada. And it's, it's always been important to the Mi'kmaq and local communities. Similarly, um, tomcod is an important component of the e- ecosystem. Eels are extremely important and threatened um, and a very high valued commercial species, but also very important to subsistence harvests. So we started with those. And of course, it really it comes down to what can you tackle in the first part of a program, so say three years, and what you would have enough funding in order to buy enough tags, to tag you know the number of individuals, to track them, to basically conduct the ocean mapping and to support the graduate students. That said, we're coming to the end of this project, but we have all val- valued it so highly that we want to continue. And so we've spent the last six months building a new proposal that would be an extension of five years And it would include the time series of lobster, eel, and tomcod, but it would also include some other important ecosystem components that are both predator and prey, and that would include striped bass, gaspero. But basically what we would like to do is build more species that are of importance to the fishers and the local communities, and also to to build a timescale that's long enough 
to study what's changing in these um, species over time with these ecosystem changes. And were those species important to the local indigenous communities and important to their cultures? So hence they had a lot of traditional knowledge regarding those species? Absolutely hit it right on the head. Yes, they I, basically we asked um, the Mi'kmaq partners what species were most important to them to find out more information on. And that they also had historical knowledge that could inform how we designed the study. For instance, where we caught and tagged individuals where we, we, where we replaced um, or placed our receiver arrays and b- basically areas of, certainly in the Bredore Lake, where there was very little known about the habitat. And so we could use our remotely operated vehicle to do some habitat mapping studies that then could inform some of the the species movements and distributions data that we were obtaining. So yes, it was completely based on what they felt would be the most important species to study. And in regards to the two ecosystems where you're studying these species, can you tell us a bit more about the history of those ecosystems and what threats there were in the past or in the present to those study species? Well, in all cases, there are varied threats and or pressures on those species. Certainly lobster being so commercially valuable is is a very contentious issue because there's also a treaty's rights to fish lobster, but it doesn't necessarily, isn't necessarily accepted by long-term commercial, commercial harvesters. And so, you know, there have been confrontations and so, you know, it's really important that we understand the movements and distribution of lobster in these areas so that we can better inform management practices that affect not just the commercial fisheries, but local communities and their ability to fish. Top cod, um, in this case, are a species that are, I think they're often called frost fish because they swim up river and spawn in January. They've just been always ex- historically very important to um, local communities, Mi'kmaq communities, and yet they're, they're declining. And eels are incredibly threatened. And yet they're, the eel fishery for elvers is, I mean, the, the value of these are just astronomically high. I can't remember now what, what it goes for, per kilo, but they're basically caught and shipped off to Asia for outrageous prices. And the the overfishing has been happening for a very long time. So uh, the the abundance of eel has has declined drastically. So Manga Bay has covered the Apocnematoltic project. And in the article, the writer Moira Donovan points out that historically, management decisions about these species haven't always included the indigenous and local viewpoint. And who was free to benefit from those fisheries was also a point of conflict. So obviously your research into these species takes into account indigenous and local fisher knowledge, and that can in turn inform management decisions. But has the project also helped resolve the conflicts over who gets to benefit? You precisely, you hit the nail on the head. I, I mean, that is, that is our aim. And, you know, I think um, despite a federal commitment to reconciliation, uh, those who are exercising their rights are facing conflict with others in our fisheries certainly commercial fisheries. And this isn't just a local, regional, or national problem, but one that many regions and countries face. And I think we've all felt that we can set an example of how to achieve success in developing new kinds of management and conservation practices by working together. So have the findings of this project actually been used to inform any management regimes at this point? Or can you say how that might work out in the future? Yes, well, we're, we're, we're certainly, we started to lay the groundwork. I think two to three years of research is, is, is not enough to be able to definitively say which management practices need to be changed. But we have Department of Fisheries and Oceans, DFO, is at the table. They're one of our partners. And they're listening also very intently to uh, 
you know, the Mi'kmaq um, viewpoints and they, you know, understand how we do need to incorporate these different knowledge systems to enact better management plans. We've, we're a little uh, um, more ahead of the game, for instance, in some of our work in the Arctic, which is not part of this project, but where we were actually able to show that these management boundaries had nothing to do with, they were drawn based on the fact that they thought there were two different stocks of Greenland halibut. And in fact, by the tracking studies, we found that they simply, they all moved back and forth between these boundaries and way outside of them even. And so in fact, um, there were two separately managed fisheries that in fact were the same population. And so we were able to actually help the Inuit protect their rights by, you know, redefining these management lines. Now that work began uh, maybe 10 years ago. So we're just at the start of this. I think if we are able to get this next grant funded, um, we will have, we will begin to have a a better time series and a little bit more detail on on exactly understanding the habitat distribution. But you can only kind of learn so much in the first sort of pilot project. So I think, but that's what we are all working towards. And I I think ultimately it, um, listening to one another and understanding the need for changing management practices is, is absolutely forefront in all of our agendas. So to wrap up our conversation here, could you say something about the importance of incorporating all ways of knowing into management practices and conservation initiatives? It seems to me that that is going to be key to pretty much all conservation going forward. Yes, it absolutely is. And I think it's it's urgent too. I mean, we need all the information we can possibly get in order to deal with the pressures facing ocean and aquatic ecosystems and and their changes. And so it's just a no-brainer that combining and using all knowledge available is is critical. I mean, we are we are really at a critical point worldwide in terms of managing the sustainability of our fisheries and oceans. And so I think we can very safely say that what we've learned is that you we have to do this. Um, without question, we know that. And I think we've begun to understand that you have to do more than just hear what one another has to say. You have to generally listen to the values and input shared by others. Um, You have to take the time to build the relationships and you have to be respectful and trustful of people's opinions and knowledge and, you know, treat them all of equal importance. And I think both I don't want to say sides, but I'd I'd say, you know, we've all learned from one another. And I think even our Mi'kmaq partners who have huge respect for the animals that they, that support their communities, they do not take it lightly. And they, they have amazing sorts of ideas for conserving these species and, and sustainably managing them within their communities. But that said, they never would think of bothering or I, sh- I should say harming an animal or, or interfering with an animal if they don't, didn't need to. And so I think, for instance, learning how to tag an animal um, safely and when they, when they were able to see that this can be done very safely and sustainably and that that individual animal can then tell us so much about the population in a wider capacity. So like you, you tag 20 individuals and they tell you, so those individuals, they're, they're tagged very safely and humanely, and they can tell us so much more about what's going on with their population. And I think now, for instance, our Mi'kmaq partners who never thought they would participate in, for instance, surgery to implant a tag are now very comfortable with it because they know the safety and they know the importance. Uh, And on the other hand, They've also taught us about, you know, as scientists, we're used to sort of going in and, and uh, I, I guess, setting up a study, making ex- experiments, but now doing it in a way that is totally respectful of everyone's values and 
of the, the animals and the ecosystems we're studying. If you enjoy the Mangabe Newscast, we ask that you please help spread the word by telling a friend. That's the best way to help expand our reach and keep the show growing. Another way to help is by becoming a monthly sponsor via our Patreon page at patreon.com slash mangabay. We are a nonprofit news outlet, and just a dollar or more per month would really help us offset production costs and hosting fees. So if you're a fan of our audio reports from Nature's Frontline, please head to patreon.com slash mangabay to learn more and support the Mangabay Newscast. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash mangabay. You and your friend can join the listeners who've downloaded the Mangabay Newscast nearly a half a million times by subscribing to this podcast wherever you get your podcasts from. Or you can download our app for Apple and Android devices. Just search either app store for the Mangabay Newscast app to gain fingertip access to new shows and all of our previous episodes. And of course you can read all of our news and inspiration from Nature's Frontline at mangabay.com. Or if you prefer to keep up with us on social media, follow us at facebook.com slash mangabay or on Twitter and Instagram. Our handle is at mangabay on both those platforms. Thanks as always for listening to the Mangabay Newscast. I'm your host, Mike Gorecki, signing off. I'll actually be taking a little break for the first time in six years of this podcast. I'll be taking paternity leave for the next few months, so I will see you in the fall. <laughs>